Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Today, I have the opportunity and the privilege of interviewing Jared Lopes from the Dad Tired podcast and Dad Tired Ministries. I'm really excited to, 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 to listen to and to interview and to talk to Jared because he, I think he's going to have so much insight, not only from what the Lord's taught him, what he's learned um, over his intentional pursuit of fatherhood and being a husband and being a Christian man, uh, but he's been in the rare, pos- rare position of being able to interview hundreds of Christian men throughout the world, successful Christian leaders and fathers and husbands. Uh, and so he's really, I'm sure, garnered some information and some knowledge and insight that um, is going to be extremely, uh, I think it's going to be a big blessing to me. I know it'll be a, a big blessing to uh, to, to everybody that listens. And so uh, before we get going, I'm going to I'm gonna read a quick bio about Jared. I'm sure he'll share a lot more of about who he is and, and his story, but I'm going to read this just so you have a little bit of a context, a little bit of a context going in to this episode. So here's his bio. Jared Lopes is a Christian author, speaker, and the founder of Dad Tired, a nonprofit ministry focused on equipping men to lead their family well. He hosts the weekly Dad Tired podcast, downloaded over 3 million times by men from around the world. He and his wife, Layla, live in Portland, Oregon with their four children. We're going to probably be talking about some of his uh, resources that he has on the Dad Tired website. Um, If we mention anything during the interview, I'll be sure to link it in the show notes, whether it's books he's written, courses he has, um, you know, again, I already mentioned his podcast. Uh, So yeah, thank you so much for listening this week. And uh, if you enjoy this podcast, be sure to leave a rating or a review on iTunes. If you watch this podcast on YouTube, uh, maybe subscribe, hit the like button, do all those types of things. Um, so yeah, with all that said, we'll get today's episode going. The now that we're a family. All podcast. right, ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited to introduce you today, Mr. Jared Lopes from the Dad Tired Podcast and Ministry. Um, I've known about Jared and his ministry for, I think, four years now, and it's it's certainly blessed me. And I've talked to numerous men that it's blessed, and so I'm really thrilled and honored to have him here on the podcast. Jared, I, I gave a brief introduction to you before the podcast started, um, but would you be able to, in your own words, kind of introduce yourself and, and give our listeners maybe a brief, you know, origin story of how you got from maybe, you know, a young, un- young, single, unmarried man to where you are now leading married men? Yeah, well, I'll, uh, I'll do the best I can to be brief in that. It's an interesting story. <laughs> you know, what's funny, man, is that even as we're starting this, I'm noticing I have my daughter's like baby food from breakfast on me. So I'm just like living out the, uh, the dad tired mascot right now. <laughs> That's great. I love uh, it. Good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I'm married to my, my wife. We've been married about 12 years. We have four kids, um, 10 years old, all the way down to eight months old. And so uh, certainly tired. Uh, the ministry that I run is called Dad Tired. And we're trying to help guys stumble their way to spiritual leadership. So just figuring out what does it look like for us as young parents to first on our own fall in love with Jesus and then try to help our kids. And specifically, I talk to dads. And so what does it look like for us as dads to try to lead our family? And sometimes that's really intimidating because we don't even feel like we're leading ourselves very well. Mm. So then to like put on the title of spiritual leader for our family feels really intimidating to a lot of guys. Mm. And so we're just trying to figure out what that looks like and stumble forward in that together. Um, I didn't plan on starting a ministry or anything like that. I, I was a pastor for 12 years in the church world. So I was a teaching pastor, discipleship pastor. And then I, um, I helped a friend plant a church and that went really terrible. Um, <laughs> that's like the, the, the G version of that story or PG version maybe. Um, but uh, in reality, it was like a rated R version. Like it was really terrible and messy and hard and uh, I actually got really hurt by the church, um, specifically this one person. And I had made a commitment, like, I'm never going to be in ministry again. I don't ever want to do this. This is hard and hurtful, and I don't trust people. And I had heard people say that they had been hurt by the church before. And I'm like, yeah, it's probably on you, you know, because <laughs> I had never seen it <laughs> sure. personally. 
And then I got hurt by the church. I'm like, oh, dang, like this is a very real thing. And um, anyway, so I, I kind of spiraled out, man, if I'm totally honest, like I, I was depressed. I was lost in my own identity and who I was in Christ. And I pulled away from my wife. I pulled away from my kids. We had two kids at the time and we were fighting all the time, my wife and I. Um, and in hindsight, it's crazy to think about this now, like, you know, in, in perspective, but I legitimately was thinking about divorce, like very practically, like how we would split up custody and where I would live, where she would live. And Layla was thinking the same thing, my wife. And um, we were in the middle of a fight one day. And I remember it so vividly. We're in the bedroom and we're fighting. And she said something uh, to me where I'm like, oh, okay, we're about to fight again. So I'm like, my adrenaline gets up as a man. I'm like, all right, I can feel my heart rate rising, you know, and I'm like, all right, let's fight. <laughs> in my brain. And so I say something to her to hurt her on purpose. Like I say something purposely hurtful mm. and she gets tears in her eyes, which actually caught me off guard because Layla's really emotionally strong, especially when she's like in f argument mode, like she just goes straight logical and that, that nice. makes me yeah. too, outsmarts me, you know? <laughs> and uh, so we're in the middle of this argument. I say something hurtful. She gets tears in her eyes. And, um, and I remember thinking to myself, oh, I'm winning this argument. Like I'm up. And she said, Jared, I want you to know that I've been waking up at two in the morning every morning. And I go into the living room. I've been setting my alarm and I've been praying that God would capture your heart again. Mm. And I'm just like, you know, what do you say to that? Yeah. I, I was like ready to slam doors and be loud and whatever. And she tells me that she's been waking up and praying for me. And God just really used that man to like, chip away at the hardness that had been built up in my heart and really start to recapture my heart to his. And I know I'm giving you a long winded answer to a short question here, but um, that was the start of dad tired because I started to process kind of online, basically hmm. uh, like a good millennial does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and just, and say like, you know, I, I feel like I am not the husband. I'm not the dad. I'm not the man that I wanted to be yeah. every day every man in my family has bailed and now I'm getting ready to bail. Mm. And I just don't want that to be my reputation and my family legacy. And so guys started to agree with that or like resonate with that. They're like, I, man, I don't want to, I want to be the man God's called me to be too. I just don't have this figured out. And that slowly started a ministry. I always say God tricked me back into ministry. I had no <laughs> desire to start it. And all of a sudden I found myself more and more like devoting more and more time to it. And now here I am these years later, it's a full-time job and I'm writing books and we do podcasts and conferences and all stuff. And, and God totally tricked me back into it, but um, I, I couldn't be happier. Like the way that he's re first restored my heart, sure. restored my marriage and is now using our story to help kind of capture guys' hearts back to his. Wow. That man, I love that story. Thank you so much for sharing that, that I, I don't think I had heard much, a, a lot of that. So I'm really glad that I got to hear that, you know, getting to that place um, there might be a lot of people that can relate to that. I can know I can relate to that at different seasons. Um, you know, I, I don't have as many years uh, being married as, as you two. So maybe like, it's not been as dramatic for me, the highs and the lows yet. Um, but I getting your heart to a place where you've got this true desire to lead your home well, to, to love your wife well, um, and then finding a step to then do that. Um, I think can be challenging. From my experience, I've, I've been able to sit under some great biblical pastors, um, which I'm extremely blessed, and I'm currently under a great biblical pastor. However, practical insight sometimes seems lacking within the church. And so did you find yourself looking for practical insight and practical steps? And, and if so, did you find some? Or is that kind of where you came up with the phrase, you know, stumbling, where you're thinking, okay, I know I need to work on my heart, which I can do through the word of God, through teaching, through prayer. Um, but then get, but then you have to still get up the next morning and you've got children, you've got a wife. What do you say? What do you do? Did you, did you find some practical help there or is it, has it, did it take a while? Well, when I first started that tired, there wasn't a lot. Um, yeah. there, since then there's been more, there's some really good resources out there, um, for young parents, but there wasn't a lot of the, at the start. Um, and, and I think just in general, like when sometimes our churches get stuck, we really like to think high level stuff, you know, yep. what does this say in the Greek? What does this mean mm -hmm. in Hebrew? All good stuff. We should study the Bible well and be good theologians uh, of the scripture. All of us should. But 
you know, what does the gospel say when my two-year-old slant literally yesterday, like right behind me, my, uh, my two-year-old was playing with my eight-month-old and they took a vase and they just slammed it on the ground and it shattered yeah. pieces, you know, like, what does the gospel say about that? And yeah. that, and that's what all of us parents are dealing with. Like, okay, I got bills to pay and I'm working hard and I, my kids are like breaking stuff in the back and it's just chaos. And I'm not really sure how the gospel and what I'm learning in the scriptures ties in with my everyday life. Mm. And, um, and so I just wanted to, you know, try to create resources where people could do that. Like, does the gospel apply here? Does yeah. like the biblical truth, the good news of Jesus apply in these moments? And I'm convinced it does. Um, and so I'm just like, all right, you know, how, how do I start to tie those two things in? I couldn't find, to answer your question, I, I couldn't find a lot of things like that. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, something that's been hugely convicting to me and I just read actually in a parenting book is I think a lot of times for me, it's so easy to think, that, okay, parenting is the problem. So I need to get more equipped with parenting or mar my marriage is the problem. I need to find some resources to support that. Um, but I just love this first chapter of a book that I just read on parenting really addressed where, where's my heart. It's so easy to overlook where our current heart is and say, oh, I need to be a better dad. I need to be a better husband. And, and, uh, maybe I just need to evaluate my own heart. And it sounds like that was the first step for you. And that's obviously where God is always so gracious and faithful to meet us in that area. Okay. So I've got your book here and I have read it and I wanted to ask you a couple things because, um, I mean, to be quite, to be quite honest. So I found your podcast, um, I think three and a half years ago, I was living in Bend, Oregon, not far from where you live. And, uh, I just had had my second child and I found your podcast extremely helpful. I love the stories, love the testimonies. Um, and then I think I found it challenging at times. You know, I, I, I think it's chapter five called Hide and Seek. And this, you realizing our own insufficiency, you know, your, a lot of your ministry is really just, I feel like, bathed in humility, which is so crucial to, to any type of leadership. But then trying to bridge this gap of feeling insufficient you know, sensing humility, but then acting in confidence. And that, that bridge between feeling insufficient, maintaining humility, and then acting in confidence, um, what have you found to be helpful in maybe walking yourself through that, walking men through that? Um, because I never want to lose humility, but I also want to be able to feel confidence in who God's called me to be and, and even find feeling equipped to lead out in my home. Hey everyone, I wanted to take a quick minute to let you know about the first ever Now That We're a Family program that was created exclusively for men. So if you're a man or if you're married to a man that has a desire to grow in areas pertaining to faith, um, marriage, leading their family, growing in their capability of earning financially, growing in their physical health, the growth initiative is probably the program for you. And it's launching in January 2022, but we're starting the sign up waiting list right now. So if you go to now that we're family.com forward slash growth initiative, you can join the waiting list. And there's some are there there are some huge benefits to being a part of like the early bird waiting list because we're gonna have some bonus material that's only available to that waiting list. So you won't want to miss that. So go over to actually you know what you should probably just click the link in the show notes. That's the easiest thing to do. But if you don't want to click the link, you can go to now that we're family .com forward slash growth initiative, get on that email list, and we're going to be letting you know about the launch of the growth initiative, which you will not want to miss. And what an insightful question. Really, really great question. Um, the, I think the key there, my confidence comes in knowing who I am in Christ. Amen. And, and so I know that I'm loved, <clears throat> not based on what I do, or what I have, or what I can accomplish, mm. but just simply because I'm a beloved son of God. Mm. That's my confidence. Um, but I have to be rooted in the gospel, which, and, and you can define the gospel in a lot of ways accurately. You can mm. define them inaccurate or the gospel inaccurately sometimes, yeah. but there are a lot of accurate ways to define the gospel. There's no like one clear definition sure. of scripture. Sure. The one liner. Yeah. Right. But the way that I would define the gospel in the most simplest form is God didn't bail on us when he should have or mm. could have. God stuck around and then he decided to, instead of not only did he not bail on us when he could have, but then he said, I'm going to stick with you and I'm going to make all things new again, mm. 
I'll, I'll fix it all. Uh, and I'll start with you and your heart, but I'm also going to do it through the whole world. Like all of creation will be fixed and will be made new again. And so um, that thought gives you a lot of humility. I always say the, the good news of the gospel is only good news when you recognize how broken you are. Mm -hmm. Amen. If you don't recognize how messed up and how jacked up you are, then the good news isn't actually that good a news. Right. Um, and Jesus talked about this in parables, like, you know, when to, who is more grateful, the one who is forgiven a little or the one who is forgiven much? Well, the one who's forgiven much is most grateful. Mm -hmm. And I can only be grateful if I realize how much I need to be forgiven for. Mm -hmm. And so there's that constant, what you were just describing is that constant balance of I am broken and I am in, in many ways um, before my salvation wicked and sinful in the eyes of God. And, and so I, I hold that, like, I feel that deeply. I always say like, man, you, even if you didn't even judge my actions and all you did was look at my thoughts, you'd be like, oh, dang, that dude yeah. messed up. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. And we all are like that, right? Yeah. We're, we're, we are twisted and sinful. We are prone to sin. We are prone to wander. We are not prone to righteousness. And so I hold that really like close and on the forefront of my mind. I am, if you leave me alone for a little bit of time, or you, you give me a little bit of my own flesh, I am wandering away from Christ. Hmm. And so that's always at the forefront of my mind. And at the same time, knowing that this reality is true, that God did not bail and he does not bail on me. Hmm. So he saved me. He's continuing to save me and he will save me. Meaning he rescued me in the middle of my, my sin and my junk. He's continuing to take all this brokenness and make it new. And one day he'll make it completely new. Mm -hmm. So those two tensions you hold really, really close and tightly. I know I'm messed up and, and broken and sinful. And yet God saved me and he called me righteous mm -hmm. and he gives me a new name and a new heart and he re-identifies me. And so knowing those two things are true, I've got a ton of humility and I've also got a ton of confidence because it's not based on who I am. It's not based on what I can do. I know my own works can't you know, prove out that God's going to love me anymore. He just mm. does because of who he says I am. And then you walk around with those two things really tightly. And I think if you get either of those off, mm. um, you, you water them down and you just become not the person that God's called you to be. Wow. Yeah. I, I, I really appreciate the way you just articulated that because like you said, it does seem like it's a balancing act and we only, I mean, God knows our hearts and then we know where we're at in our own heart a lot of times as well. Um, and I think it's easy to look at people's uh, maybe uh, seeming, seemingly bravado style of living and say, well, man, I don't want to do that. I, I know I'm a chump. I'm going to talk about who I am apart from Christ. And you can fall, like you said, too far to that side of you know, wallowing in your sin and who you were prior to Christ and not having any, you know, I guess, uh, confidence or even conviction to lead your home. But on the, on the flip side, I think you can forget where you, who you were prior to Christ, forget about the, the depravity of our own heart. And, uh, and, and in so doing really, uh, you know, do a disservice and disrespect to what Christ has accomplished on the cross. Um, and so I really appreciate the way that you articulated that. Um, and, and I think that's something that I'm really excited about with being able to point our audience to your, uh, to your platform and to your resources at that tired, that tired, um, is uh, the gospel apart from the gospel. It's so, it's so meaningless to try to put some sort of, uh, systems together in place that can maybe modify your own behavior or, you know, improve your children's performance in a certain area. Um, while there may be some temporary benefit from those things, the eternal and long lasting benefit is lacking. Um, and you are so rooted in everything that you say, you don't depart from the gospel. And if there's anything that we are guilty of doing as Christians, it's almost like moving on from the gospel. And I know for myself, I'm, my brain just goes to, it goes to law. It goes to cause and effect. Okay. If I do this and that happens, that's just where I naturally go. My, my brain does not naturally think, oh, somebody took care of it all for me. And now I walk in that reality. And so I'm really, really appreciative of you and all your programs and all your books, not departing from that, making that the firm foundation. So thank you for doing that. Um, I was wondering if you could share about some common themes that you've picked up from, I mean, you've had the opportunity to interview 
many, many fathers, many leaders in the Christian uh, world from around, from around the world. And um, I'm, I'm sure through that you've picked up some common insights, but like, can you think of a, a few nuggets of people that you would consider successful Christian men, Christian husbands and fathers and leaders in their communities that you've been able to take from, you know, hundreds of interviews? Boil it down. Sure. Um, A couple of things right off the top of my head that I think is the best leaders that I know, um, the ones who have mentored me, the ones who I've seen from afar, um, the best leaders I know are ridiculously intentional. Um, ridiculous. Like they are, they are full focus, intentional. And I I write about this a lot, but one of the, in the last chapter of that book that you held up, it's called find your Aspen. And it's kind of a a play on the dumb and dumber movie, which I I shouldn't recommend as a Christian. Yeah, exactly. I know you haven't seen it. I've never seen it before. I've never seen it, but but we can reference it. Yeah, exactly. I read about it in Christianity today. They did not. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. But the, the point there is that I know what the goal is for me and as a man, for my marriage and for my kids. And I'm just, you know, you strive hard after that goal. The reality is you could just use a a different analogy. You could use the analogy of like, just say you're driving down the freeway. And if you don't have a destination in mind, what often will happen is you just pull off of any exit that looks interesting because you don't really know where you're going. So it's like, oh, this one looks interesting. Let's just pull off here. Maybe we'll eat at this restaurant because it had a sign or whatever. To put that analogy into practical terms, uh, for any parent or any dad who doesn't have a a very clear outline of where he's trying to go, like the destination that he's trying to get to, um, what will happen is other people will tell you to exit. And so they'll say, practically, it would look like this, like, hey, your boss will say, I mean, come on, can you just put in like 20 extra hours? Can you put in 10 extra? Can you work a little bit overtime? Like, this Mm -hmm. is a really important project. We need to, we need to get it done. And you're like, oh. Okay. Yeah. It sounds important. You've convinced me. Let's pull off of that exit and go there. Maybe the, 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 the exit is um, it's temptation. Hmm. You're looking at something online or there's a woman or there's a thing that you know, you shouldn't be doing, but you don't really know where you're going. So it's just like, well, this seems interesting right now. Mm -hmm. So you pull off the world will throw all kinds of exciting exits for you off of the freeway. Just divert a little bit here And what ends up happening is you end up miles and miles and miles away from where you actually wanted to go. You just never articulated where you wanted to go. Mm. So the best leaders, and this could be man and woman, like husband and wife, they think through, um, they're leading their family and they think through, where do we want to go as a family? Where are we actually trying to go? What does our marriage look like 20, 30, 40 years from now? What do we want to see in our kids 20, 30, 40 years from now? And what that allows you to do is say no to almost everything, even good things that uh, that don't make sense for that, you know, the destination where you're trying to get to. And I, man, I offend a lot of people. They'll say, Jared, can you do this? And can you do that? Can you come volunteer at this thing? Can you do whatever? And I'll just say no. And um, I'm, I've got my wife still like feels uncomfortable. She's like, how do you say no? So like so boldly. And I'm like, because if I say yes to that, then I'm saying no to this. Mm. I'm saying no to more time with the family. I'm saying no to being intentional with my kids. And even though that, that thing was a good thing, sometimes, sometimes it's bad stuff, but sometimes it's a good thing. Well, I can say no with confidence because I know where I'm trying to go. And a, a yes to that is a no to the things that God's called me to. I'll, I'll end with this. I know I'm rambling a lot, but I'll end with this thought. Um, you, I had a mentor tell me this and it, it changed my, my perspective forever. Um, he said, Jared, you'll have a lot of job titles when you die. You'll do all kinds of different things, but you will die a husband, you will die a father, and you will die a disciple. Crush it at those things and say no to everything else. And that was like Mm. very simple terms for me to understand like, all right, those are the three things I'm going to focus on. Everything else does not get priority for me. Wow, that is powerful stuff. I, I, okay, so yeah, I mean, it just reminds me of, again, there's so many, I think, like maxims around this, but the line, if you don't prioritize your life, somebody else will. And that certainly goes with our family. And I think you wrote something recently along the lines with the concept of being like, hey, picture 120 years from now. You know, we, we love making, uh, you know, goals for the year, five years, 10 years out, where you want to be when you're retired. Um, but that mindset of 120 years, a thousand years from now, what 
where, where is everybody going to be? How are you going to be doing? Where are your children going to be doing? And certainly our soul, the salvation of our soul becomes like top priority. Nurturing that and discipling our children becomes a top priority. And so I think you do a really good job of giving that big, big picture view. Because, and, then, and then in addition to that, I'm going to say a couple more things because I, you know the word stumbling your way through leadership, it's not wandering your way. It's not guessing your way, because I think it, sometimes people might think that's a syn- synonym for that, but it's really not. You can stumble your, we all do that, but you, that doesn't mean you don't have clarity of a goal and a clarity of an outcome. And, and you're certainly not discouraging anybody from sitting down and being intentional, but then having this awareness that if you know like where the North Star is or, or where your Aspen is, uh, so to speak, um, you are going to stumble, but then you know where you're heading when you when you get back up. Um, and so I think distinguishing between stumbling and, and wandering or you know fumbling around is a is a is a big important thing to do. A big important thing to do. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. And I think that the cra- I have this thought all the time. My wife's an oncology nurse, so she actually walks a lot of people, as morbid as this sounds, into death. And it's a calling, like she views it as a ministry to, to go through the, their journey for months. And a lot of times it ends up awesome. And sometimes it doesn't. And, and, and so death is just kind of always on the forefront of our minds. And you just think this is a weird thought, man, but you think a hundred years from now, not only will I not be here, my kids probably won't even be here. Like the whole world is going to be gone in a hundred years, all 8 billion or however many billions of us there are, we're all gone. Uh, And just think about you. If I pull up my phone right now, like all the things that are going to just try to convince me that this is the most important thing. I'm like, that's right. But if you have the perspective that in a hundred years, all of us are gone, all of us, that doesn't feel that important anymore. Yes. (laughs) Yes. That's that important. And so I think we have to have that big picture mindset or we get trapped taking exits that we never wanted to take. Amen. That's so good. Um, I'd like to ask you about your family leadership program um, that I was just looking at because uh, I know I love direction. I'm I'm constantly signing up for courses, for coaching, for conferences in different areas of my life, whether it be for business or mar- my wife and I are going to a marriage conference this weekend. We're excited about it. Um, but if, could you break that down to our listeners and kind of wh- where you start and where you end in that four week course? Yeah. So there's, uh, there's a lot of free resources we give podcasts yes. um, articles pdfs things like that we have books that you can get all really i i think great tools to try to help guys stumble their way forward towards intentional leadership but our our family leadership program is the most intentional thing that we do so i think it offers two things number one a very clear plan so for for the first 30 days it's a lifelong program so once you're in you're in and like you we'll, we do live trainings and we do all kinds of stuff to keep equipping you but the first 30 days are the most intense and we give you homework every day. Some of that homework is actually writing out, where do I want to be five years from now, 10 years mm-hmm. from now, 40 years from now. And you have to write out in detail your marriage, your kids, you personally. So there's a lot of practical exercises. We talk about morning routines, getting control of your schedule, learning how to say no, like all these really, really practical things for guys. There's Bible reading plans. It's like, it's pretty intense stuff. So that's, it, it's one resources to equip you as a man, as a father, as a husband, and as a worker. Those are the four areas that we focus on. But then it also provides community. Man, some of the, the friendships and the relationships that come out of it, um, I always say it's easier to find guys who will watch a game with you than it is to find guys who will help point you to Jesus. Hmm. Most guys don't have that. Even guys who go to church, it's hard to find guys who are like linking arms and like, man, I am serious very serious about being the man God's called me to be. And I want other guys around me to help me get there. And so we have a community of men who are just like really, really passionate about that. And dude, these friendships, like I I hear every day, guys who meet up, they end up finding guys in their area. They're grabbing coffee. It turns into let's grab dinner once a week, turns into, Hey, you should meet my wife. Your wife should meet my wife. You know, let's get our families together. And all of a sudden you've got these cool communities of families who are now super intentional about being the intentional family that they feel like God's called them to be. So those were the two things I would say. I would say resources and community to help you get to where God's calling you to be. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, and and for those listening, I'll make sure I link this in the show notes so that you can find your way 
uh, find your way over there. I already referenced your Dad Tired book too, which I've really appreciated in your podcast, the Dad Tired podcast, um, which is just a, an amazing, just amazing resource for encouragement and direction. Um, okay, as we wrap up here, we're gonna wrap things up. I this is a, a question that I was wondering if you could, you know, humor us all. Is there a recent resource within the last six months? This could be a book, a movie, um, you know, a documentary, a conference, um, a pamphlet. It could be anything, a quote um, that has served you in in di- the direction that you want to be going as a as a Christian man. Okay. And uh, he wrote a book called The Intentional Father. Hmm. And uh, he what he did was he he has kids who are older than me, but he took his 13 year old son when he turned 13. And he, from 13 to 19, he had a super intentional plan down to, here's what I'm going to do with my son weekly. Here's what I'm going to do with my son monthly. Here's what I'm going to do with my son yearly from 13 to 19 to make sure he's actually growing into manhood. By the time he gets to 18, 19 years old, he feels confident. I know that I'm a man. I know that my dad loves me. I know who I am in Christ and I'm ready to go tackle the world. Like really, really intentional stuff. And, uh, and then he documented all that in his book. And like, here's how other dads can do that. It's specifically for fathers and sons, although he's working on resources for fathers and daughters. I have three daughters. So I'm like anxious to hear. Sure. Yeah. I have a son who's about to be entering into these, these um, preteen years. And so um, to what he would say is use these years now where you have young kids to develop a plan. So he's like, get rid of Netflix get rid of like night Twitter, Instagram, TikTok scrolling, whatever you're doing and spend 30 minutes a night developing a plan so that when they hit these critical years, mm-hmm. both your sons and your daughters, that when they hit these critical years, you've got a very strategic plan to help them grow into adulthood. And man, it was like, it was a game changer for me and a lot of the guys in our audience. So that would be the first, um, the, the big one that sticks out in the last few months. That's great. I'm I'm really excited to check that out because I think that that is one of the most common questions we get, you know, is um, there it seems like people are accustomed to finding resources for young children, um, for child training, for, um, and then even, you know, when they get a little bit older, but that those teen years finding, it seems like parents just kind of like, even leaders just kind of get quiet about those years, you know, pastors just kind of like, I don't know, you know, it's like, it's, it's I don't know how to, yeah. Yeah, so it, it sounds, this sounds like a great resource to check out. Uh, fantastic. Jared, any closing words you have for our audience about uh, leading their families, pursuing the Lord? Yeah, I would, I would just say this for anyone that's listening. Um, I, I imagine if you're listening to this podcast episode or you're watching it, you are striving to be the kind of parent that you want to be, that you feel like God's calling you to be. And there's probably a piece of you in the back of your mind that's a little bit nervous like am I going to mess this up and Mm. I better listen to more podcasts or read more books because if I don't I'm going to mess this whole thing up and I don't want my kids to be messed up I would just say that the fact that you're even thinking that is evidence that God is already pursuing your family's hearts everyone's Mm. family's hearts Um, God gave your family you with a desire to be more like him that means he's already working And so even as you listen to this right now, just take like a breath, just relax a little bit. God is at work. You're listening to this episode because God is at work. You want your kids to be more like Christ because God is at work. God is at work and God will do whatever he wants to do. And you're not dumb enough and you're not smart enough to mess it up. Uh, You can't like, there's just, God's going to do what God's going to do. He said he could use the rocks and trees to worship him if he wanted to. Um, And for some reason, he lets us be part of it. So if you're listening to this, you can rest a little bit. The good news of the gospel is he's redeeming all the world. He's redeeming your kids' hearts, your husband's heart, your wife's heart, all back to him. And uh, he's going to accomplish what he set out to accomplish. That's the good news. Of- wow, that is, that's an, an encouraging way to wrap things up. Thank you so much for sharing that. Folks, if you've enjoyed listening to Jared speak, please check out uh, dadtire.com. You can go to the Dad Tire podcast. You can find him on, on I'd, I'd say, most of the social media platforms. Is that right? Um, and then you can find his, his books on Amazon. Um, there, He's just really been able to develop a plethora of resources that are so helpful to our life as Christian fathers. So go check that out. And, and really for Christian families, go check that out. Jared, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Yeah, it's been super fun. Thanks for having me. Yep, absolutely. 